Hi everyone, and welcome to delivering desktop apps with Docker containers. I'm pretty excited about doing this particular session on this particular topic. It's a little bit more esoteric than what you might expect from a typical Docker talk on using containers, which are typically related to things like web apps and things that you can put into a container that are what we call headless. But this one is going to use a particular use case that I have found to be an interesting use case and might have some implications on modernizing old apps that you might have sitting around in your data center somewhere and you got to figure out how that you're going to put those onto new and modern platforms such as things that you might go into the cloud. But a little bit about me, I'm Blaze Stewart. I'm an architect at Wintelec. I'm also an Azure MVP and I specialize a lot in Azure infrastructure as well as Docker containers on Azure. So my niche is really kind of the intersection of containers and Microsoft Azure. And I really do spend a lot of time investing in all the technologies on Azure that do run containers, but I'm also a little bit broader than that. And I actually do develop and infrastructure as well. But enough about me, let's get right into what we're here for, which is the talk that we're gonna be looking at how to use containers to deliver desktop applications. Now, one of the main reasons that we like to use containers is for application consistency and application delivery. So application consistency, what we're talking about there is figuring out a way to consistently deliver apps across any number of different infrastructures. That could be Docker Swarm, Docker, uh, on my desktop, it could be Kubernetes on the cloud, Kubernetes on premise, regardless of what infrastructure I deploy that app onto, it's going to run the same because it's running in a container because all the dependencies and everything is packaged in that containers. And then there is the possibility of using that for desktop apps as well, where I can package everything I need to run an application, including all the frameworks I have for my desktop app and deploy that in a container. And also with application delivery, what we're trying to do here is figure out a way to get applications onto desktops or into the cloud, regardless of which way I choose to do that for not only headless apps, but GUI based applications. And that's what we're really going to be looking at today is how I can deliver these applications in a consistent way that I could use for my desktop applications. And I'm going to show you a couple of different methods that you could use to employ application consistency, application delivery using desktop applications. On most Linux systems, you need something called a Windows server to render the display for a given application. So I have something called X server, which is a Windows server that can interact with applications. In most cases, X is the case for the window manager on most uh, given Linux based systems. And the application will interact with that X server writing and reading input from it. X is then responsible for receiving input from your peripherals, things like your mouse and your keyboard. And it sends that information back to your application. And then the application will send some kind of output, typically in the form of a graphical user interface. And then X receives that. And then it writes it to some kind of display, which could be in a local context, a monitor. But it's not always the case that it's a local display. It can be a remote display. So with a container, what I can do then is wrap up my application inside of a container. And then I can use something like TCP to relay that information from my application to a remote X server and then have that remote X server display it on a remote display. So in a demo I'm going to do here in just a minute, we're going to set up an X server on Windows and then I'm going to use a Linux based app inside of the container to relay that information back to an X server on Windows. And then I'm gonna use my keyboard, mouse and monitor on Windows to display that application. So it's gonna feel more like a native Windows application. However, it's actually going to be running in a Linux based container on a, another system, which in this case would be a virtual machine created by Docker desktop. For this demo, I'm going to start with this Docker file, and it's an Ubuntu based image that I'm using a couple app get commands in this run command here to install Abby Word, which is a word processor. And I can start Abby Word with the simple command Abby Word, and that will launch this word processor. So I chose this app because it's very easy to install on Ubuntu and it makes for a very clean Docker file too. And I can use this for this demo. So I need an X server to communicate with though, because this isn't installing an X server. I need that X server to be available. So I'm going to start the an X server down here in my Windows host. And to do that, I'm going to launch VCXServe, which is a project on SourceForge that you can go out and download and install it just like any other Windows application. It's a pre-built binary. You don't have to compile it. And I'm going to use XLaunch here. 
And I'm gonna walk through this wizard and basically take the defaults in the first two screens, use multiple windows, start new client, and then I'm going to check this box, disable access control, because I'm running in a local context. If I was running this in a network I didn't trust, I'd probably wanna enable that and then set up my container to use secure connections. But for this local context, this should be fine. And then I'm gonna click next and then click finish. And then that's going to start my X server, which is down here in my tool tray now. Now with this particular Docker file, I can then launch a command prompt to build it. So simply run Docker build um, and tag the image Abby Word and then use the local Docker file. It's using cached images here, so I don't have to sit here and wait for it to build. Uh, but then I can use Docker run, and I'm going to specify a few uh, options on the Docker run command so that it makes it more realistic. So first one I'm gonna use is a volume. So I'm gonna basically mount my C drive into this container so that I can access files inside of this word processor that will be written to my uh, host file system here. So to put that, I'm, uh, I'm just going to use you know, C dash drive in the root of my container. And then I'm going to specify an environmental variable. Now I need to do this so that my application knows where to write the actual output to whatever X server I'm doing. So in this case, I'm going to use the TCP base output that is supported by most X servers. And I'm going to specify my IP address for this particular virtual machine. Now the thing after the colon is the index of the display server, which in my case is zero. So I'm going to use the first available uh, X server. I could actually run multiple X servers in this context if I wanted to, but I'm going to use this, this one right here, which is the only one I have running. And then I need to specify the image, which is Abby Word, and that should be everything I need to actually launch this application. And so if this works, we'll see it start my application here, which looks like a more or less a native Windows application now because this is something I can maximize, minimize, move around, and because the X server is being managed by Windows. And now if I wanted to open up a file, for instance, I can then browse out to my C drive, which is mounted here, come down here to my users, Blaze, and maybe I have something in my documents. Uh, there's there's a, a file here that I used in another demo I was doing with this same Docker file. And I can save that, you know, save it out or I can and uh, save as or something like that uh, and save it as this one. Sure. Overwrite it. Uh, and then I can exit this application. I can quit and then it's going to exit my container. So it's actually waiting for Abby Word to exit. And so my container terminates and it's no longer running. So this is a very basic demo of how you can set up a application like Abbey Word to run on a remote X server, which is very, very convenient for running a lot of Linux apps inside of a Docker context. There's another possible architecture that you can use for this, and it looks something like this, where you have a application that is running in some kind of context, and it's communicating with a local X server. So this local X server is running on the same host as your application. And then the output and input for that X server is encapsulated in some kind of network protocol and a remote client attaches to it. In the previous example, we looked at how you can have a remote X server, which is actually simpler to set up because to get a remote X server set up, you simply just install that and you point your output to that remote X server. In this case, we actually are involving another application or another kind of client that connects to the output from that X server. And that client then is actually taking the output from your peripherals or your output from the actual application and putting that onto a local display. And this is the approach that things like VNC take or Expra take. Expra is a project that is designed to do this very same thing. And VNC has been doing this for years as well. And in this case, the boundaries of our container would be around the actual X server and the application. So in this case, we would actually containerize X as well as the application. And then we would use some kind of remote client to connect to that. But what I can do with a application that's set up in this fashion is I, once this starts, it does take a little bit to start because it's bootstrapping all of the actual components to run the X server. And then once it's actually up and running, I should be able to launch a browser and then pull this up. So this would be running on my local host on a port 10,000. So if I go local host, um, colon 8080, um, this is going to start Expra. And then there's Abby Word running on Expra inside of a browser context now. 
And this is a nice little well, window-based uh, X system that they've created for Xpra that, that works fairly well. Um, I, it can get laggy at times. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it is, it's certainly usable for most of the time. And I, I'm going to show you a demo in a minute how you can accelerate this if you need some better performing applications, but it doesn't have the nice window Chrome and the ability to drag and drop windows um, inside of a browser context. And uh, this one I can then browse. So you can see there it's timing out. So that's because the the, the actual container, the protocol is, is trying to adjust uh, uh, based on the demands of what I'm actually trying to do here. And so this is a little laggy for uh, most for some applications. So it's not my preferred way to do this, but it, it is functional, even if uh, it is uh, trying to reconnect to it. And sometimes you end up getting those kinds of uh, warnings and I can open up files just like I did before, uh, where I have my um, uh, documents full here and edit document right inside of a browser now. And this particular one will should open up my uh, file here. And there it is. So it is a little slower than what I would hope it to be, but Expert does work and it's simple to use. I want to show you another approach to what we just saw with Expra and Expra is an all in one package. So it does basically everything for you and all you need to do is set it up. This approach uses BNC to do basically the same thing, but it's more piecemealed in that it uses a bunch of different projects to ultimately render the actual application in a browser. And this one is a lot more performant though, because I can take advantage of things like OpenGL and the animation ends up being a lot more smoother in the browser than it was with Expra. And I don't get the kind of lag that I get with Expra. So this stack looks like this. And I want to show you this stack because it is not exactly clear when you, you, when you see the Docker file. So basically it starts with the app and that could be any application that is a GUI based application in Linux. And then on top of that, you have something called a window manager, which in the context of the extra demo that we saw, that was the window Chrome. And in this case, I'm gonna be using a window manager called Rat Poison, which is actually designed for a keyboard based window manager that allows me to use keyboard commands to maximize, minimize, move around windows and things like that. And so it's very bare bones and very minimal. So it's very lightweight and which is more ideal for containers. And then the rat poison along with the app interact with the X server. And the X server is what Xpro was providing for you. And we've seen X, uh, X server outside the container already as well. And then once I have the X server uh, external as uh, installed, well, along with rat poison in my app, I can actually write the output from my X server to something called a virtual frame buffer, which is essentially like a virtual video card. So it has a virtual memory that it uses to be the output for the actual graphics that get written by the X server and the compositor and all of those things that are below it in the stack. And then what I can do then is take the output from the X server and read that output to actually have a VNC server look at that and encapsulate it into some kind of network protocol. And in this case, it would be the VNC protocol, which is used very widely in the, the Linux context for connecting to uh, remote desktops and then getting access to remote apps over networks in the Linux context. It works on Windows and Mac as well. But once I have Turbo VNC, I can't natively run a VNC client in a browser. So I need to wrap that with something. And that's where the next piece comes in, which is something called WebSoxify, which basically can take any kind of TCP uh, stream and then wrap it up in a WebSocket, which then can be used to serve up it to a browser application, which then can be consumed by some kind of HTML five client, which in this case is going to be a product called no VNC, which is an HTML five VNC implementation that doesn't require that I have any kind of app installed. I can actually use VNC right inside of my browser. So this stack is actually what you have to install to get an application to render in a browser using VNC. Now, this is actually much more performant. And that's why I went through the process and the painstaking effort of actually making all this work. And I think you'll see the difference when I actually containerize an application using this one in another demo. Now, here's the Docker file for the stack that we just looked at. And the reason we looked at the stack is so that you didn't have to parse that all out by just looking at this Docker file. Again, it's a Ubuntu based uh, Docker file. It's uh, got some parameters here that I'm setting that are used by the Docker files. 
And this is some that are used to automate the deployment of dev packages with the actual app gets and the DP, dpg uh, installer here and now what this is actually doing is, is again using abby word right here but it's installing all the third-party repositories it's setting up things like rat poison no vnc web Soxify, and then some OpenGL uh, support libraries down there here it's doing some configuration uh, here it's installing OpenGL, here it's installing Turbo VNC, which it's used by, uh, so I can get that acceleration and get some better compression using Turbo VNC for the protocol. And then it's uh, configuring Rat Poison right here um, to actually do some of the uh, things that I need to uh, have this thing set up. So whenever I launch Rat Poison, it actually launches my application, Abby Word. And then down here, it's creating a certificate, which I'm really not using in this case. Um, and then down here, it sets the command to start VNC, uh, Turbo VNC. And then it calls WebSoxify uh, to wrap around a folder for no VNC, which is the HTML5 client to access this. And then it's using port 80, and then it's exposing uh, localhost 5901, which is the port for the actual uh, VNC server. So WebSoxify is wrapping around that so that it can actually display that in a browser uh, and then use the VNC client inside the browser. So this is a much more involved uh, Docker file. So let's go ahead and build this guy and then run it. And I'll show you why this one is much more performant when we see it in action. So let's go ahead and run this one, do a Docker build on it. It's probably already cached uh, inside of my uh, local images here. Uh, and I'm gonna call this one VNC and then use the local Docker file. And it's already cached. So let's do a Docker run. Let's do our dash V here and do C colon backslash. Again, put that at slash C drive and the root and then call my, uh, I'm gonna do a port here. So I need to do another port forward here. Let's do this one 80, 81, but the port I'm exposing in this case is port 80. And then I need to specify the image, which in this case is VNC. And that should run my actual uh, VNC demo here. And this is going to start all of the uh, things I need for my actual application to be running inside of this container using VNC and all this other stack that we looked at here. So I can come over here, launch up and open a new tab. And in this case, go to localhost uh, 881. And this is going to pull up a list of files. I'm gonna click on VNC here. And uh, then I'm going to make sure that my port and my host name match what is up here in my browser. And then I'm going to type in password one. Let's make sure that that is the right password, uh, password one uh, right there. And then I'm going to connect to this. And this is again using Abby Word. And now this one doesn't have the ability to move the window around or resize it, but this one does perform a lot better. I'm not getting any kind of lag on this. Um, my menus are much more responsive. I can go and browse this. The animation is much smoother. Uh, there's a lot of advantages to doing it this way because uh, the performance is just a, a world of difference here. I'm not seeing any kind of lag on this at all uh, that I was getting with the other approach. Now, I want to show another demo that's uh, that I've used this very similar Docker file, but this one I'm actually going to use Chrome inside of a container, and I'm going to show you how that works. I'm not going to show you all the nitty gritty details, but it will give you some animation on the uh, Chrome browser that will show you that it's actually using OpenGL to render that. So here is the Docker file for Google Chrome. It's basically the same one that I had before, but instead of installing Abby Word, I'm actually installing uh, Google Chrome here to do the actual. So here's the Docker file for Google Chrome. It looks a lot like the one we just looked at. The main difference is that this one is installing Google Chrome instead of installing Abby Word. So I'm doing some additional steps to get the repository for Google uh, and then the so here's the Docker file for Chrome. This one is a little bit different than the one we saw just a minute ago, but basically the same flow. This one, I'm actually downloading Chrome and then installing it here using app get commands. And then I am then configuring this 
particular container to use Google Chrome here in a node sandbox mode because I'm running as root. I probably shouldn't do that. I'm in the real world application. I'll probably want to run something that is more secure, but in this case, I'm running it as root. And then I'm doing the actual launch just like I did before. Everything is pretty much identical in this particular Docker file as the one we saw with Abby Word. The main difference is this one is running Chrome. So again, I can build this one. Let's go Docker. I can run Docker build and uh, do a dash T and just call it Chrome. And then you run this one. It's going to use all cache because I just built this. And then I can then run this using Docker run, just like I did before. In this case, do a dash port forward, a dash P for port forward. And then I'm going to put it on 8082 to port 80. I'm not going to use a by uh, any kind of volume on this one. I don't really need that because this is just an internet browser. I guess if I wanted to say things like favorites and that kind of thing or history, I could do that, but I'm not going to in this case. And let's just call it Chrome. And this is going to start the Chrome on port 8082. Uh, and then I can launch a new tab here in my browser and connect to this on localhost. So 8082 uh, VNC, let's just skip right to the actual page. And then I can type in the password right here and connect. And this is the launch screen for Chrome. So it's going to ask me, hey, make Chrome your default browser, etc." Click OK here. And this is going to take me to the actual page here. Notice this animation on this home page is pretty smooth. And that's because it's able to take advantage of some of the OpenGL rendering that is provided by way of Chrome and using CSS animation to do that. So I can pretty much go to any uh, website that I want to go to and it's going to pull up fairly quickly as well. So again, here is a animation that is using CSS and OpenGL to accelerate it and it feels almost native speed, not quite, but it's pretty close for running a desktop application stream back to a browser. There are two caveats I would like to point out to this. This is for Linux only uh, based implementations. Windows containers do not have the support for UI based applications in Windows containers. And there were some early attempts at this, but most of them were hackish. And today they don't really work in the newer versions. The second one I would make is this really isn't going to be useful for GPU intense applications that have graphical outputs. Now you can use GPUs in containers for things like AI and big data for video rendering and those kinds of things. but you need a, you really need a way to capture the output for a display and uh, you can mount a GPU into a container and take advantage of it for GPU workloads, but you'd really need to be able to capture that display output and then stream it to something that can actually display it like a monitor. And that doing that all in a container would probably take you outside of the context, really what a container would be useful for. This is really more oriented towards line of business applications that some of which will take advantage of OpenGL or GPU acceleration. And those generally will work okay, as we've seen with uh, Chrome demo. But there is the question of old Windows apps. They're not, they're not out of the question. There are ways to make old Windows apps work on Linux and therefore make them work in Linux containers. And some examples might be like VB6, WinForms, Java, GTK, old browsers like IE5, 6, and 7, or even Flash-based applications. And you can use some kind of either porting the code to a new framework or wrapping it up in something like Wine. So some possible approaches be, would be to migrate something like a WinForms app to Mono, which is an open source implementation of .NET. And they have the WinForms implemented more or less. Not everything is implemented, but you could maybe port the uh, .NET application using WinForms to Mono. You could take advantage of cross-platform frameworks like GTK and Java for those kinds of applications. So if they're more oriented for Windows, you can probably compile the code to run in Linux as well and can take advantage of those cross-platform uh, UI builders like Swing and AWT for Java or GTK, which is used widely inside of the Linux space already. Or you can use Wine, which is a emulation environment for Windows-based applications on Linux. And what it attempts to do is provide a compatibility layer that translates Windows, uh, Windows system calls into POSIX calls. And then you can then run your Windows applications on top of that. Now, this application or uh, or emulation is not a virtualization, so it's more of a compatibility layer. And it's not 100% compatible with all Windows applications. Some apps work great, some don't work at all. Some of them work okay. Some of them work in, in pieces, but if you click on this button, it crashes. So Wine is one approach. And I do wanna do a demo of how you can take an old app and port it to Wine. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. 
For this demo, I'm going to look at this Docker file. And this Docker file installs Wine in a container and also installs Wine Tricks, which is an automation tool for doing a lot of things in Wine. I'm going to go ahead and launch this. I've already built this container, so it's called Docker Run. And um, I'm not going to do anything real fancy here. I'm just going to do a dash IT to get an interactive mode. And then I need to dash uh, E and then set a display so it knows where to write the output for the X server that I have running on Windows here. And I'm going to use display zero. I'm going to use uh, the container. Uh, the container image is called wine. And then I'm going to go to bin slash bash uh, so I can interact with this interactively using a command prompt or shell and then i'm going to launch wine tricks and this will take a second to set up so we'll come back when this finishes so wine tricks is up now now with wine tricks you can select the de default context here and then come into wine tricks it's going to throw up a bunch of little dialog boxes and this is where you can actually set up things inside of wine in your container and once you have everything set up you can do that by selecting dlls or frameworks such as net in this case i would install net or dll if i was using a specific version of a dll i can select that like DirectX or whatever it might be and i have everything set up then i would then uh, get out of wine tricks and then i would copy my file from my mounted volume into my application and i've already done this so what i'm going to look at now is another little example here of a docker file so once i've copied everything over and what i would do is exit the container do a docker commit against that container and convert that container into a docker image and then i would write a docker file against it that would look something like this and with this particular one i basically did a docker commit called it net5 net35 and then set the command to do wine against my app which is the name of the exe that i would otherwise use for copying something over from wine so once i have that i can i can very easily run this and i think i've already built this one as well so i can use this particular docker uh container here and um if i go uh docker images i think it's called my app and let's see what that looks like and it's called uh not net 35 text pad i think is the one i call it simple pad that's what it's called so if i go docker um docker run and then i do dash uh, e and i do my display variable again and i do uh 192.168.255.134 colon zero and then i do a uh, simple pad for my container that has the this little uh, text editor running in it um, I can just simply launch that and it should launch my little application that's running in wine. And this is a .NET, uh, uh, .NET 3.5 that's a WinForms application that is running in wine. But now it's in a Windows, and now it's in a container that I can then open a file and edit a text file. It's a very basic application. But this allows me to have something inside of a Docker container that's actually a Windows application. So this is one way that you could do Windows applications inside of Docker containers and then have everything streaming back to an X server, or you could use the VNC or the Expert approach that we've seen already. Thanks for coming to my session today. There's a few things we can do as follow up. Of course, you can always follow me online at the One Mule on Twitter. I constantly post there and interact with folks. You can check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash one look now. I post a lot of content related to Docker there, including some extended demos for what we've seen already today. You can check out my blog at www.blaze.net and I blog about Docker and other things related to tech there. So you can definitely read about that. And you can find all of the demos that we have today, all the content related to that so the docker files and any other source files that we mentioned in this video at my github repo at github.com slash the one mule slash dockercon dash demos so thanks for coming to my session i look forward to seeing you around the conference and in future conferences related to docker or wherever that might be